Welcome to Business and Politics, and thank you for being so accessible to uh, the Manila Times and, uh, and me for interviews. Well, it's always great to talk to you. And the last time we, we, we talked, um, there were a lot of um, uh, hanging issues with regard to our seafarers, but there have been some major developments since then. Um, if I were describing, and please correct me if I'm wrong, that we sort of got a reprieve, is that correct? Would, would that be a better way to? The issues are not exactly resolved, but there were enough things done to, to continue doing the reforms that were needed so that our Filipino seafarers can continue working in European flag vessels. Is that how you see it? Yes, and very importantly, the certifications will still be valid, which was absolutely essential. Okay. So, but there were also promises made that need to be followed up. Okay. And what the industry really needs here in the Philippines is to have more stability now. Okay. So there was a lot of uncertainty created because of the outstanding issues and what would happen with certifications. Now the Philippine government made uh, a lot of promises. There's still implementation left to be done. Right. Get that right create stability around the industry and make sure the Philippines still is seen as an attractive place to hire uh, seafarers. All right. So what, what we saw from, from the palace was this new coordination between Marina and CHED and I guess to a certain extent the, the, the Labor Department and the Department of Migrant Workers. But Marina now, as we understand it, will take lead, right? Mm -hmm. uh, there were also some schools closed and then uh, Chad promised to work with Marina on designing curriculum. Are these the things that were most urgent? Um, are you happy with the changes that you've seen so far? Um, and, and, and then maybe moving forward, what are, what are the things that uh, Denmark or maybe to a large extent Europe would like to see the Philippines do so that uh, they feel safe working with Filipino seafarers? There was a, a real problem with subpar schools, okay. and this was not just a problem for us, it was also a problem for the Filipino seafarers who okay. didn't get the education they were paying for. Okay. And I think that's sometimes lost in the discussion, right. that people pay a lot for this education, and, and it should be nothing, high quality. You know, and it, it, you just know, a piece of paper. It's a piece of paper, and, and there was even this risk that you know it might become worthless. So I think that that's a very important issue. So closing those schools who are not delivering was a very important thing. Uh, improving the curriculum, but also following up on the schools. Okay. So this is a very important part of the promise that there will be a review process, and it will actually, you know, work. And uh, there have been reviews before uh, a review model, but it wasn't working very well. And concentrating more of the effort around Marina seems to be a good way to resolve some of the issues that were. Uh, but we're quite optimistic. Now there's also opportunity here. So it's not just, you know, the threat of, of losing the certificates. Right. The shipping industry is undergoing a lot of changes and the Philippines is well positioned to sort of grab the opportunity of some of those changes. Like the whole question of greening the industry. Okay. Which will require, you know, new kinds of fuels, right. new ways of, of running ships. So that's one example. Another one is female seafarers. Okay. Where the Philippines certainly could be one of the countries where you could find female seafarers. Okay. Which is something that the industry is asking for. Now, before these uh, announcements, um, were, were there um, difficulties in processing papers of Filipinos going to Denmark? Was that an issue? Uh, is, that, is that different now? Uh, are, are, or are we seeing an, an easier process, I guess, for, for deployment of our seafarers for Europe? What, what's the situation maybe in your embassy? Yeah. I, for the processing of papers, it's not a, a difficult it's, issue. It's not the issue? No, it's, it's very institutionalized. Okay. And, you know, both the, the, the sending and receiving end of the system are very well attuned to what needs to be done. Okay. Uh, the real issue was, you know, are the certificates going to be valid? Right. And that's not just a question for Europe, because a lot of countries globally rely on the European certification system, and their laws refer to the European system. I see. So if the Philippines fell out of that, you know, it would be much more difficult for Filipino seafarers to get jobs on international ships. Right. So in that sense, it was very important. Yeah. What we will see, however, is again an opportunity where Denmark and the Philippines will work together. This is a, a, a thing that has been agreed between Marina okay. and the Danish Maritime Authority to actually make uh, seafarer books digital. Oh, okay. Now, the Philippines has a system for that. So you actually have a digitalized seafarer book.
Okay. And Denmark has a digitized version for the shipping companies. Okay. Uh, and what is that? I, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm a little well, is that a log? That, uh... Yeah, a seafarer's book is a very important document okay. if you're a seafarer. And okay. it, it's, you know, it's like a passport. You can actually I travel see. on okay. it. Okay. And it sort of tells uh, where you've been and where who you are employed by okay. and uh, which ships you are, are uh, linked to, etc. Right. So it's a very important document. Okay. And it allows you to travel forth and back okay. uh, to sort of board the ships wherever they are. Right. Uh, and having that digitized would reduce friction for the seafarers and for the shipping companies. And Denmark and, and the Philippines is now on the back of, of this clarification of the certification issue. Uh, going to work together to try to show the world that you can have a digitalized uh, seafarer system. So again, you know, yes, there is more work to be done, but there are also some opportunities. And Denmark wants to help the Philippines see some of those opportunities. Right, I wanted to ask you about that. Does the inspection include uh, some European officials accompanying Archad officials inspecting, or is it more of a capacity building? effort where you, you try to pass on learnings and technology and best practices or is it a mixture of, of both? It's a mixture but mostly we rely on the reporting coming from the Philippines itself uh, but there is also there are also visits from Europe to here yeah. uh, so uh, it's it's a combination of those two and really when it comes to to the capacity building side it's about improving the, the seafarers education and we can see uh, several European countries stepping up their efforts, trying to help the Philippines establish, you know, uh, a more modernized uh, Standards, curriculum in this yeah. area, which will make the seafarers more attractive to the global market. Right. So, what, what uh, other countries are, are competing with Filipinos for those positions in, in Europe? Uh, Indonesia yeah. here is, Indonesia, is, is a big one. Yes, right? and, but it's not just Indonesia. And this is yeah. why it was so important uh, what I said before, there needs to be a more stable situation okay. surrounding Filipino seafarers because okay. there are a lot of manning agencies which okay. are quite large operations here, you know, hiring thousands of people and sending right. them around globally. And, you know, that's a costly business to build and operate. And if people are uncertain whether or not Filipinos can actually go abroad and work, they're, yeah. they're simply going to scale down their manning uh, operations here and there'll be less Philippi options for Filipino seafarers. So the, the big competitors, one is Indonesia, another is India. Okay. There are also some that have dropped out, like a lot of Ukrainians and Russians used okay. to be, but, but they're not there because of Because the of what's war. happening in the yeah, war. Yeah, because of the war. And what is also happening now, and which is important for the Philippines to be aware of, is that the shipping, the big large shippers are spreading their bets. Okay. And this is a side effect from the Ukraine uh, war, where Russia uh, came in and attacked Ukraine and, and those groups fell out. Because the sh big shippers sort of saw themselves in a vulnerable situation. W what if, for whatever reason, the Philippines would fall out of the I equation see. or Indonesia or India? It's too big an impact. I see. So the, the competition will be going up. There will be more countries with international seafaring. I see. Now, uh, Denmark is, is obviously a maritime country. I, I hear that uh, that sector contributes something like 20% to your GDP, which is quite substantial. Um, the Philippines is trying to, I think, come to grips that it's a maritime nation as well. I think recently there have been calls for a maritime agenda and for our policymakers to look at their maritime resources and maritime policies. How would, you know, if, if you were to give advice, right, then in crafting that maritime agenda so that it's, you know, as productive as Denmark's maritime industry. Um, how, how could we go about it? Because seafarers doesn't, you know, the maritime is just more, not just the seafarers. It's, no, a, it's, a, it's a much, much bigger area, right? So, yeah. Well, I think the Philippines, you are an archipelago and, and you should have a natural affinity to have a, a strong shipping industry. Right. Uh, in Denmark, we have what we call the, the blue water 
policy, okay. which is a broad-based uh, paper which describes a, a broad basis also of the political spectrum, okay. which tries to look at how to improve the competitiveness of the Danish uh, shipping industry. Okay. And that is a long-standing policy document. It gets uh, revised, for, you know, every three, four, five years when needed and the industry and the government are in constant you know interaction about how does this work the trade unions also play a role in that so i think you know building national consensus on how do we make the shipping industry competitive because it's not just about as you said one thing it's not right. just about having seafarers you need to have port structure that that infrastructure that works you need to link that port structure up to land based transportation you need to make sure that if you want to be a shipbuilding nation that you have wharfs and, and people who are able to to work in those those wharfs that qualify you know welding and all these things so you really need to look carefully at how can we become competitive and work your way out of that and there are a lot of regulations also here so red tape for example make Making it more attractive can be important. Yeah, you, you made that comment at our last event that the uh, Filipinos have invented uh, or seems, seems to have innovated red tape. Yeah, and new ways <laughs> of, <laughs> of doing red tape. That's true. But um, you know, in, in most countries, you know, the the, the people in the in, in the maritime sector tend tend to be, you know, uh, based on my observation, you know, in the lower classes, right? Yeah. Um, not just in the Philippines, but in, in many other countries. Yeah. That, but that's not the case in, in Denmark. I mean, so no, that's true. How, how do you change that mindset? Is it do we begin with education? Is it uh, did you have a maritime agenda? Did it did it take that, or it was simply just a way of life for you guys that you know it, and that that became the the, the spring well now for all sorts of policies and national strategies that, that you came up with. It is true that one of the things that differentiate the Danish shipping industry is that it's been possible to attract some of the very best and brightest yes. into that. And this is because some of the, the, the two leading companies, which were the East Asiatic company, Öko, it was called in Danish, and Maersk company, they were deemed two of the most prestigious places to work. I see. So even if you were a lawyer or a high-end engineer or, you know, uh, accountant or whatever, it, it was deemed, you know, very attractive to work in these companies. It's not like that in the, most of the rest of the world. Right. Now, you can't rely on history alone. Sure. And the Danish shipping industry understands that. So they have asked the government to uh, have a maritime university grade degree developed. I see. So, and that is in place now. So now we are sort of preparing for more intense competition when it comes to talent. And, you know, a, a company like Maersk is doing a lot to uh, widen its uh, talent base. They're also globally looking outside of, of Denmark a lot. I mean, the, they employ a lot of, right. of highly talented foreigners, including Filipinos. So it's really... Uh, getting the right talent in, okay. making the workspace attractive for them. And I think because of the changes that are happening in the shipping industry, okay. you'll see more digitization, you'll see more integration between land and sea, I see. you'll see less reliance on the people on the ship, so to say, and okay. more on you know, the, the managing the complexity of value change, stuff like that. All this will attract higher end uh, high, more qualified workers into that industry uh, and there will be competition for talent. There is sure. a lot of competition for talent. Sure. Well, very exciting times. So. Uh, we'll take a quick break. Uh, this, we're talking to Ambassador Melbourne of the Danish Embassy. This is a, this is a politics. So please stay tuned.